brand equity is built through consistency mm -hmm. and uh, through commitment and dedication. And so we we put that into the recipe for the company from day one and into the product. Building brand equity is uh, really important to communicating the, the truth of the fact that although we're a startup, we're a stable and permanent company. Our objectives are long-term. We are long-term thinkers. We're not thinking about the next quarter. We're not thinking about the next round of funding. We're thinking about what is going to make our customers and our partners happy so that they keep coming back and they tell their friends. Welcome to Industrial Sage, a free video podcast series all about digital marketing for industrial manufacturers. Hear interviews with your peers and find out how they're solving the same challenges that you might be facing in your own field. Coming to you from the Optimum Production Studio in Atlanta, Georgia, this is Industrial Sage. All right, so let's jump into today's episode. I have Jason Walker from Waypoint Robotics. He's the co-founder and CEO. Jason, thank you so much for joining me today on Industrial Sage. Yeah, thanks for having us, Danny. It's great to be here. Well, it's going to be good. So we met, um, I think, at Modex in, uh, was it two years ago? So 2018, 17? I lose track yeah, of time. Yeah, 17. 17, okay. I think 17. I, that that sounds about right. So yeah. Anyway, so we, we well we were there. We were doing some videos, and we met and had these super cool, um, you know, robots and all these things going around. So for those who aren't familiar with who you are, just let us know. Yeah, these guys. Or actually, it wasn't the big guy because I think that was maybe uh, last yeah. year or so. Um, but, um, but yeah. So anyways, so you, you guys do robotics. But tell me like about who you guys are. You guys are a startup. Like tell me tell me that story. Yeah, uh, so Waypoint Robotics, uh, we're going on three years, um, and uh, we're making autonomous mobile robots for uh, factories, and um, we're really trying to build tools that the small to mid-sized manufacturers uh, will find uh, cost-effective and easy to deploy. And one of the main ways we're doing that is by building a robot that is easy to use, not in the context of uh, robotics engineers, but in the context of the people who are moving materials now. So the assembly line workers, the shipping and receiving clerks, the dock workers, those are the people that we intend to have the, to, to own this tool and to set up the robot and configure it and reconfigure it and use it and deploy it. And so we think that in a situation like we've had where there's this huge labor shortage, if we can empower the workforce with great tools, they can be the ones that uh, that create that extra efficiency and increase their own capabilities, uh, get involved in Industry 4.0, and help their companies be competitive in a very dynamic uh, global market. Awesome. Well, you know, there's definitely a lot of you know you mentioned you know big big you know topic buzzword Industry 4.0, uh, a lot going on in the space for that. Um, but you know, one of the challenges that you guys have, have had when we were talking before off camera what a little bit was, you know, with this whole move with new this new, you know, shift in technology, you know, industry 4.0, like there's a especially as it comes to robotics, sometimes there's a there's this idea that uh, and we could talk about AI as well, but anyway, it's a whole different topic. But um, that you know these robots are gonna come in and, and totally take take away uh, you know people's jobs. How do you guys like what like how have you addressed that? Well, we uh, we've addressed it. So that was one of the things on a personal level that we really felt like we wanted to reconcile. Mm -hmm. um, we care about the workforce. We uh, don't want them, you know, to to be left behind or not included, and that's a big part of what drove us to do this. And so the philosophically, that's what drives it is. Uh, you know, the companies love their people and the people love their companies and um, they just need better tools. And so philosophically, that's where it comes from. But on a more technical level, if you look at the data, the data shows that, uh, that, that countries and states and organizations that adopt robotics and automation technology actually 
uh, have increased productivity growth. Um, they have increased uh, GDP. All the data points to the robotics and automation actually creates jobs, creates opportunity, creates more revenue. Um, but there is a part of the workforce that that can get left behind. And hmm. the low skilled workers are the ones who are susceptible, as the data shows, uh, to to being excluded from from that that rising tide that raises all boats. And so that is exactly the person that we want to be able to give the tools to, to be able to, to do that work, but in a much more efficient way. Um, and if you're a company that, uh, that's trying to hire more workers and you can't find enough help or you need to increase your efficiency to be more competitive, if you don't need to go find a roboticist to go with your new robot and you can use the folks you have there already that you know and trust, then you're solving multiple problems simultaneously. Um, and so that's some of the reasons why we've worked so hard to build a great robot that we can make easy to use, that we can put in the hands of the existing workforce and empower them to strengthen their companies and strengthen the economy. That's awesome. So what are, okay, what are some, um, I, I guess, some specific use cases for, you know, some of the problems that you guys are solving, you know, I guess you said it's not exclusive to, you know, inside warehousing and on docks, but I'm, I'm assuming, unless if I'm, I've got that wrong, but, um, you know, what are, what are, what are some of these, the typical use case? Yeah, so we built this product so that it would work well in a uh, a small to mid-sized manufacturing environment. Think of the family-owned 50-year-old machine shop mm -hmm. that has been working great the whole time, even without Wi-Fi. And that's a tough environment for an autonomous mobile robot for a handful of reasons. One of them is that you're not going to tear down the facility and rebuild it around the capabilities of a mobile robot. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one is that the work tends to change every day or every week. Mm. And so if you have a robot that cannot be uh, configured and reconfigured by the people you have on site, then it is immediately a non-starter to be able to deploy it. So we built a robot that would work well in that manufacturing environment. And if it can work well in the most chaotic and difficult of environments, then it works great for warehousing. And we have customers who are deploying them that way. Um, and it works great in larger, more uh, organized manufacturing operations, uh, you know, for much larger companies um, and being deployed that way. And so uh, and, and we also have a customer that's an industrial cricket farmer um, and we industrial have uh, animatronic. Okay, cool. Yeah, we have an animatronics company. Um, so the lots of researchers. Um, we uh, recently uh, shipped a robot to uh, uh, Washington River Protection Services um, who are uh, monitoring the um, uh, nuclear uh, waste tank farms uh, with it. So wow. um, really broad applications. If you build a really good robot, then it's, it's broadly applicable. Um, and, uh, but we want to make sure that the manufacturers can be a part of the revolution mm. and that the workforce they have are also a part of it. Awesome. No, that, that, that totally makes sense. So, um, which is super cool about all, all those different applications you have there, especially if you have the nuclear, I, I'd love to learn more about that, but I don't know if we can talk about that, um, without having some sort of classification, but, um, <clears throat> the, um, y y let's talk about, you know, so, you know, startup, You've, you know, maybe there's a little bit of that 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 messaging and misconception uh, challenge uh, to to get out there, um, and also from you know being a startup, getting your name and all that. You know, from a sales and marketing standpoint, you know, obviously this is a very emerging technology, emer emerging markets. It's not it's it's not mature by any stretch of the imagination. It's kind of like the wild wild west a little bit. Um, wh what have you guys done uh, in order to kind of break through that? Um, I think it's sort of a two-part question. One, um, you know, a, 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 what are you using to address those misconceptions? And then also, what are you using to generate that awareness that, hey, we're here? 
Yeah, we do. Uh, we we do and always have done a lot of inbound marketing. Um, we've always been exceptionally brand conscious, and uh, brand equity is built through consistency mm-hmm. and uh, through commitment and dedication. And so we we put that into the recipe for the company from day one and into the products. Um, and so we charted a path early, uh, very specifically, and we have stuck with it and we have added to it. And so um, building brand equity is uh, really important to communicating the, the truth of the fact that although we're a startup, we're a stable and permanent company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we are, uh, we're a privately funded startup. And so our objectives are long-term. We are long-term thinkers. We're not thinking about the next quarter. We're not thinking about the next round of funding. We're thinking about what is going to make our customers and our partners happy so that they keep coming back and they tell their friends. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of thing um, is, is baked in from the beginning. Um, that's where it starts. And then uh, search engine optimization, SEO, uh, inbound marketing techniques, those have really been tools that we've relied on very heavily to be able to uh, create uh, the, to try to open our doors as wide as we can so that people who are looking for an autonomous mobile robot can find us. Mm. And we still find people who say, uh, wow, I can't believe I just learned about you. Um, and so there's always more work to be done, but, but those tools are really effective. And uh, video has been an exceptionally effective tool. Um, the, it, it, people love to consume information that way. And it has been and, and will be an increasing part of our strategy to be able to develop content that we can engage uh, users with. So we, uh, going to trade shows and uh, events and being involved in the community um, and talking to first clubs and um, it, it, it's all part of it. And, and it all makes a difference and it has an accumulative effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's that old, old thing about, um, y- you know, you know, you're wasting half your advertising dollars, but you don't know which half. Um, <laughs> I, w- w- we're not in that situation, but it's kind of a nice way to frame the idea that it's really hard to point to one single thing that you do and say, that's the thing. If you do that, then you'll get customers. Um, we sold a robot to uh, one of the biggest logistics company uh, companies on earth. And we were able to go back through our data and see um, trade show visits and website visits and email conversations going back for the whole history of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, they bought a robot mid year. Um, so, you know, and I think if they hadn't seen us at all the shows and if they hadn't seen the permanence and they hadn't seen, mm-hmm. um, the growth that, you know, it would have been harder to take that risk on a startup. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the, something early on just about from a sustainability standpoint, you know, that it's like, hey, and I think that's, that's a, definitely a, that's another big challenge, uh, I think, to be able to come across a, hey, listen, like, you know, are these are the new kids on the block over here, and like, are they going to be here tomorrow? That, you know, I mean, those are the real, those are, those are the real things. Um, so having those, those, those touches over that time, that, that absolutely makes sense. So you mentioned inbound. Um, are you guys using like, or like HubSpot or anything like that for, to, to, to help? Okay, cool. Um, and, uh, you know, and so SEO, so you guys must, are you guys blogging and a lot on different topics? Are there particular industries that you focus on versus not, or is it, what does that look like? We, we, we do work really hard on content creation and we try to have things that are, uh, that are generally useful. A lot of what we think about and what we talk about is of course rooted in our, our company, our products and what we want to do for the customer. And so there's naturally uh, a lot of the content we make that's, that's peppered with, with what we do um, because the reason we're talking about it is because we care about it. And when we're 
talking about a problem that people who are shopping for robots need to know about and need to know what their options are and what the pitfalls are. Uh, and, and then when we use our own products as an example of how to do it in a way that we think avoids those pitfalls, um, that's, uh, you know, that's, that, that's kind of marketing, but it's also generally useful. And so sure. we have um, what we hear from the experts is an extraordinarily high open rate and click through rate on our email campaigns. And I think the reason for that is that we don't carpet bomb people. We curate the list carefully. We have people have, who have to actively choose to opt in. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, we, when we're at trade shows, we ask them if they want to be on the mailing list. And so we have a list of, of interested people, and then we generate content that's gen- genuinely and generally useful to, uh, to the audience. And so that is another way where you just got to be everywhere and you got to be useful. You know, even if somebody is not going to buy a robot from me, ultimately, if I can help them out and in doing so help out the robotics community and, and, and help out the, the customers that are being served, then that's, that's good for everyone. That's awesome. And that kind of aligns to the whole brand equity piece there. So I'm curious, what is your open rate if you're able to share? If you said, you said it was high? Uh, it's over 25%. That's pretty good. Consistently. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's good. Um, so it speaks to, like you mentioned, to the content that, you, that, you, that you're pushing out. How, I'm just, like from a frequency standpoint, are you guys sending stuff out monthly, weekly, daily? What is that? <laughs> We aspire to do it weekly, I think, but, uh, you know, life gets in the way. Um, it, I think it's probably uh, monthly, um, and the way we do it is through an iterative process of, uh, you know, talking about, you know, what's on our mind, what do we want to communicate, or what is uh, the rest of the world talking about, and we have a thought about it. And then, uh, you know, we have uh, the writers start to work on it, and then, um, ultimately it will come back, uh, to me and I'll go through it and make sure that if I'm a roboticist reading that content, mm-hmm. that it makes sense that there's not some small, uh, a- accidental or easy to misunderstand term that is, is, is maybe flipped around a little bit, but completely changes the meaning. And, you know, an expert would realize that, you know, this isn't an expert. So, <laughs> right, yeah. um, so we, we, we really care about the, the quality of the product that we put out in terms of content so that it's not, it's not just interesting and engaging, but it's useful and it's reliable as a good source of information. So you mean you're not just trying to sell them every single email that you're sending, hey, buy from us. You're actually providing value? <laughs> we try. Yeah, we, we really do. Um, and, I, you know, I've spent the last year uh, giving talks of one kind or another to all sorts of different organizations on how important we think it is that robotics companies should be building products for the existing workforce mm-hmm. and how important it is that, that the people who are buying robots are are demanding and expecting that to be the case. and. So uh, I always say at the end of my talk, I hope nobody listens to me um, from the robotics industry because that will be great for me. Um, <laughs> but if they do, it'll be great for everyone. And so uh, the robotics industry, especially AMRs, is small enough at this point, albeit you know, at a ridiculously uh, high trajectory, um, that it's so small and everybody's doing things that are differentiated enough for the most part that we can all have our niche and we can be collaborative um, and, and cooperative uh, as opposed to cutthroat and trying to do a race to the bottom. Um, it's, it's certainly competitive, uh, which is great. That's, that's what you need to push the envelope. And, uh, but yeah, you know, it, 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 I feel like the more people know, the more likely they are to choose our products. Um, and if we educate them really well and they don't choose our products, then that means they, it wasn't the right fit. Um, and I'd, I'd rather have a happy customer I didn't get than an unhappy customer I did get. Yeah, that's great. That makes absolutely a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, 
like currently you mentioned that inbound's a big thing. So are, are most of your leads just coming in through the website? Are they just like, hey, I you know found you and you're just I found this blog article about you, or I read this thing, or this case study on, on what you're, is that is that primarily how that, that's working? Yeah, and certainly there's, uh, you know, there are people who find us at, at trade shows and events who discovered us online, and sure. more often than not, um, and of course we meet people at trade shows and they, they come in as a lead through our website. Um, but most of the time, it, it really is uh, folks that are, you know, they're searching for uh, an autonomous mobile robot um, and they, they find our our web page and, um, and and find it engaging and uh, and that compels them to you know to contact us and then we reach back out and, and qualify them and try to figure out if the if the problem they have is a problem we can solve. Um, so, so yeah, that that's really kind of the the main way that we have been doing sales. Um, although we are. Uh, we just hired uh, a great new um, biz dev person, and uh, so we're going to start to um, to be more aggressive uh, going outward, yeah. as opposed to just uh, drinking from the fire hose of inbound <laughs> requests. Well, that's I mean that's great. That's I mean that is a great. Uh, I mean, you mentioned your fire hose, and it is maybe a problem. You got a lot of a lot of leads that's coming, and that's great because a lot of companies don't have that. Um, you know, and it sounds like you've built an inbound pipeline that is fairly robust in the sense that it's doing its job, you know, generating interest. And so what, uh, like, as far as where you're seeing those major sources of leads coming from, from an inbound perspective, is it from the blogs? Is it from like, what is it? Like what channel, you know, social or what, like what, what is, if you were to say, Hey, this is, this is like. People coming through our blogs all the time, or whatever. What is that? Uh, gosh, I should know that off the top <laughs> of my head, and I don't. And and I think the reason I don't know it off the top of my head is because it's a it's a pretty balanced mix. Mm. Um, we we have really great uh, organic uh, results. Just you know, people have uh, heard about us, read about us, and um, and and just type our name into the browser and mm. find us that way. Um, that might be number one, um, but uh, my marketing director is looking at me. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah. Okay. I, but it's, um, but yeah, it, you know, it, it's a pretty good mix. And and as I've been saying, you know, it all feeds on each other, and it's it's really tough to get really accurate attribution for where leads come from um, because it it has to accumulate. You know, you've got to um, you've got to you've got to demonstrate your, your permanence and uh, your value of, as someone who is worth listening to and talking to, um, to, to have people eventually be compelled to reach out. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And so, you know, from, if I could recap everything that I'm hearing really essentially is, you know, provide value, help to solve people's challenges. Let's not sell, sell, sell. Um, and, and, and really build that, you said that uh, very early on, you said really build that brand equity. Build that, build that brand through, obviously you've got you know, a great uh, you know, e- email campaigns going out uh, with, with high open rates and providing value in there versus saying, hey, you know, you know, buy, 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 that kind of thing. So I think it's awesome. I think, uh, congratulations uh, that you guys are, that you know, in, in three years have been able to, to do that. Obviously, it looks like you've got, some pretty great products there. Um, I think I didn't get to write on one of them, but one of, one of our uh, Joseph, I think you, he, he got to. You guys, I think you guys did a standing interview on them at Modex, right? You guys were both like talking on them. You're like that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had uh, one person on each vector. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, we're cruising around on it. And that's. I mean, I think I think it's super cool. I could never build, but you do that. I don't have that brain, but I really appreciate it. I think that's awesome. So um, listen, I, as we go to like wrap, um, is there any, anything that you would say, maybe to somebody who's sort of like they're on the fence and they're sort of trying to figure it out, saying, hey, it could be another startup. It could be a, you know, a manufacturer who's been in this game you know, for 90 years and they're trying to like, yeah, we need to make a pivot. What would you tell them? 
uh, in terms of uh, marketing yes. tactics, yes. strategies? Yeah. Um, uh, I would say get your brand in order and get your and then get your SEO house in order. And if that means hiring an expert or more likely hiring an agency that that can tend that garden while you're doing more important work uh, relative to, uh, I mean, it's very important, but it, you know, you generate the, the, the leads and then you've got to do the business. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think that's really important because even if your business is based mostly on going out and shaking hands and meeting people, the very next thing they're going to do is look you up. And if they can't yeah. find you yeah. easily when they do a search um, and they can't, uh, they can't educate themselves, um, then it's going to be tough to, to capture their interest. And yeah. we, we say all the time that it feels like nobody's really selling anymore. No, not successfully. And instead what's happening is people are buying. And so the way we try to think of it is, let's give those people as many tools and resources as they can to make their own decision that they want to buy, as opposed to trying to convince them and sell them something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's how we approach it. And I, I think that's certainly the thing. That's how it feels like the world is going. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. I mean, the, the, the way that the, the way that people buy, the way that we're accustomed to buying has completely changed. It's shifted. And that yeah. even in B2B. So and it will continue to do so. Absolutely. So Yeah, and you, you need to it it still pays to have those classic uh, business development relationships. Oh, absolutely. And somebody somebody who understands the importance uh, importance of keeping in touch. And, and really learning what's important to the customers. That's, that's essential. Um, but you've also got to empower people with the tools they need to help themselves. And so that's our philosophy in marketing as well as building robots. Absolutely, no, it's great. Jason, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on Industrial Sage. If anybody would, would want to learn more about you, let me, I'm, I'm assuming they can find you on the web like we've just talked about for the last 20 minutes because <laughs> your SEO is good. Um, waypointrobotics.com, is, is that the URL? Awesome. Yeah, so, exactly right. And we are, we are uh, Waypoint Robo uh, on all the social platforms. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah. So uh, learned a new word today, our new acronym with AMR. I knew AGV, but I, hadn't, I wasn't sure with AMR. So auto, uh, it was automated. Uh, what uh, I messed it up. I get all right. What is it? Autonomous, autonomous mobile robot. Autonomous mobile robot. Okay. All right. Got and, it. And and if in if in one sentence I had to say what the difference is between those is an AGV is a an an automated thing that does one thing and one thing only in one place one way and if anything's different then nothing happens. And an autonomous mobile robot is a, uh, a thinking machine that you give objectives to instead of discrete instructions. And so when somebody gets a vector in their place and gets it set up in 15 or 20 minutes, they, they don't have to meticulously plan routes. They just say, go to the loading dock and it figures out how to get there on hmm. its own. And if something's there that wasn't there this, yesterday, it'll plan another path. Well, when we're ready for our first AMR, I know exactly who we're going to. So, <laughs> Right on. Jason, thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Okay, another great episode. Hey, I hope you learned some really cool stuff, eh? like what the difference between an AGV and an AMR is. Um, and when you're ready for that AMR, you know where to go. I know where I'm going to go, and it's, it, was, it was pretty cool. So I think one of the really interesting things, um, you know, that I took away from this is that, you know, these guys – you know, uh, they're, they're a startup. They started three years ago, and they're, they're crushing it. They're killing it, um, and they're doing it. They're driving a lot of leads online doing that, you know, inbound. Um, and, you know, don't, don't think that, okay, we have to have, like, oh, we have to get HubSpot or whatever. Now, you may need it, all right, but you may not. But I think the idea is that the framework, if you think about it, is really providing value. They talked about, you know, building brand and, that, and SEO. Think about that. I think a lot of times as manufacturers – that brand thing just kind of like it's totally, you know, kind of thrown out the window 
like, oh, well, that's just our, that's just, I guess, I don't know, we have 20 different logos and it doesn't really matter and what we're saying and what we stand, ah, whatever, we're just pushing and we're just selling products. No, it's super important. Um, you know, there's a reason why they have a really high open rate for, with their newsletters. There's a reason why, you know, people are finding them online uh, and when they're looking for a, the, that product that they have, okay? So, so think about that. Uh, all right, so that's all I got for you today. So, but if you have a question, I'd love to answer it on the show. You can reach out to me at uh, industrialsage.com forward slash questions, and I'll answer for you on the show. And, um, and we'll go from there. So thank you so much for watching today. Um, that's it. That's all I got for you. I'll catch you next week with another episode of Industrial Sage. And that's it. I'm Danny. I'm signing off. See you later.